Welcome back to my channel, Beautiful Minutia. If you're new here, my name is Tiffany, and today I would like to do a dedicated book review. I don't do a lot of these on my channel because they have to be books that I could spend an extended amount of time talking about and actually be enough to fill a video, <laughs> but this is a book that I have been reading over the course of several months with some friends, and we have had discussions on Discord. We've already had a halfway live show and the finale is coming out the week that this video is coming out. So that book is Demons by Fyodor Dostoevsky, if you have not guessed that already. And as I've been preparing notes, as I've been going back through my many, many <laughs> tabs and just kind of formulating my thoughts, this is a book that I have pages and pages of notes on, and so if that's not worthy of having its own dedicated review, I don't know what is. So a little caveat before I start this video, I have read quite a few of Dostoevsky's works. In fact, this is his fourth novel that I've read, and I've read quite a few of his short stories as well. I think the only other like kind of full-length novel of his that I have not yet read is Notes from a Dead House. So that is that is in my future, but I have read a, a lot of Dostoevsky's larger novels, and so I do have some sort of basis for comparison of this novel with others, but I'm far from a Dostoevsky expert, so I don't want to make it sound like I know everything about this book or I know everything about this author because that is absolutely not true. These are just my thoughts, and there are a lot of things in this book that I feel like can be quite subjective and I have done a little research into some of the things about the ending, some of the things about the censored chapter which is quite another topic of discussion and lots of people have completely opposite opinions on what certain things mean. So take my thoughts on this book with a grain of salt. I'm gonna start with kind of just like a little overview of what the book is like, what it's about, what you can expect, and I will have timestamps listed below in the description so you can skip around because this introductory part will be spoiler free, but there will be lots of other parts that are spoiler filled. <laughs> so if you have not read this book and you're looking to, then you can just skip past those parts and just kind of hear my overall thoughts without being spoiled for the plot of the book. So Demons is a book that is very difficult to kind of give a plot about what it what it's really about, any sort of synopsis overall without it being incredibly spoilery because for a very long time in this book you are left in the dark. This book actually has a first person narrator which is pretty rare in Dostoevsky novels, usually it's a third person narrator but this is a first person narrator who we don't find out for a really long time even who he is. And so that is a very interesting choice for Dostoevsky in this book. And it is one of the elements that makes this book, in my opinion, kind of unique for Dostoevsky's novels. And another element of that is a lot of times in Dostoevsky novels and also in Russian literature in general, we start out the book being introduced to a very wide cast of characters and it can feel very overwhelming. And as time goes in, on, we zero in. And a lot of the times in Dostoevsky's works as well, Crime and Punishment definitely comes to mind. You kind of know what's going on and then you spend a lot of the book kind of delving into the philosophy of what is going on in this person's brain and, and their worldviews and their explorations of philosophy, religion, all kinds of different things. And while Demons does have elements of that, I think that it is set up quite differently. When we start the book, we are following Stepan Stepanovich and Varvara and their relationship. And they're the two main characters that we kind of start zeroed in on. And as the book continues, we kind of zoom out and we get more people added. And so that right away is a very different element to demons that I haven't really found in other Dostoevsky works so far. I would also say that a very common format for Dostoevsky books is again, the first act being inundated with a million characters and a lot of drama. And he hooks you with that drama immediately which is present in this book. But the thing that I find differs is that most of the time in those books, then act two is very much filled with a lot of philosophizing and a lot of deep discussions and commentary on human nature and things like that. And a lot of people might start a Dostoevsky and once they kind of get past all the characters, 
they're really enjoying the drama and then they hit that second part and it's difficult for them <laughs> and they may give up there and then act three just kind of culminates in this big climax and brings back all the drama and you're kind of racing to the finish and while i will say that part three in demons was like race to the finish for me to figure out what was going on i didn't feel like act two at all was broken up by these big long discussions in fact i think that there were a lot of smaller discussions that happened throughout the entirety of the novel but they were more isolated and they were smaller and almost more digestible, I would say. There may be people who disagree with me on that, but it did have a different feel because there's just this feeling of unease the whole time. You know that there is some political unrest that's happening that's kind of clear from the beginning and the fact that if you read the back, of the book. This was based on a real life assassination, political assassination that happened in Dostoevsky's time that did help inspire this book. And then this book was also inspired by What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshkevsky. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. And Fathers and Sons by Ivan Turgenev. Demons was heavily inspired and was a response to both of those books in addition to being inspired by that political murder that I have already mentioned. So there are a lot of those elements that are wrapped up in this book and so we've got a lot of political commentary, a lot of philosophical commentary, a lot of religious commentary, none of which is super unusual in a Dostoevsky book. But I will say the intense mystery that I experienced while reading this book, the foreboding and the sense of unease and this feeling of being unable to trust anything or what anyone is saying throughout the book was a much more unique experience to me for a Dostoevsky book. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, I highly encourage you to pick up Demons and give it a try for yourself because... It's an incredible book. I'll tell you right at the get-go here that I rated it five stars and it was just an incredible reading experience. In fact, I think if I hadn't had so many other things that I committed to and other reads that I committed to, I would have read Demons in an incredibly short amount of time because it's a very gripping book. So I'm now gonna move into a little bit more spoilery of territory in that I'm kind of going to talk about the kind of, I feel like the two contrasting characters. There are a lot of characters in this book and a lot of back and forth and a lot of different things that I could dive into here. But as I previously mentioned, one of the main characters that we're introduced to at the beginning of the story is Stepan Stepanovich. And then he has a relationship with a woman, Varvara. And another key player in this book is Varvara's son, Nikolai Stavrogin. I found Stavrogin's character to be really, really fascinating. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper into that in just a little bit. But I do find that those two characters were very contrasted. And it's interesting because Stepan actually was one of Stavrogin's tutors when he was younger. Both of these men claim atheism, but both of them seem like they are honestly deep down inside undecided in that front. And this is demonstrated in Stepan with his obsession, so to speak, that keeps coming up. It's not really, other people say it's an obsession. He doesn't mention it nearly as frequently, but people keep bringing up how he has this fascination and loves to talk about the Sistine Madonna and his interest in different religious icons, which for an atheist is not something that should be fascinating them you know that's something that he should just be scoffing and turning away from but his seeming softening towards those things seems to undermine his staunch declaration of atheism in the same respect stavrogan also claims to be an atheist but once we get to the censored chapter which was originally part two chapter nine in my version, it is labeled at Tikon's, but some it's Stavrogan's confession or something totally different. But once we get to that chapter, Stavrogan actually meets with a monk and he gives the monk the, his confession, which we have found out that he is already kind of clandestinely married this woman and 
he will not tell anyone about it and he keeps saying he's going to confess it, but he hasn't. And once he gives this written confession to this monk and we also read it, we see that the reason why he has not confessed that yet is because he has deeper, darker sins that he also needs to get off his chest. He talks a lot in his confession and with the monk about how he just doesn't care. And he talks about this really horrific thing that he does, which is the reason why the chapter was censored because it has to do with, you know, sexual assault on a child and then that girl also commits suicide and he doesn't stop her and so it's pretty heinous <laughs> what he does and it was censored just because you know at the time I think it was just considered too obscene too graphic too perverse to include in this but by seeing this confession we get this glimpse into who Stavrogan is, that he kept trying to find something to break through his his coldness. And he talks about doing these things and he didn't even like care whether or not he did. So it wasn't this overwhelming sinful desire to do something. It was just like he felt like he could, so he did. And he claimed that it wasn't madness or anything like that. It's just what he did. This same coldness is why Stepan's son Piotr actually really kind of is obsessed <laughs> with Stavrogin and wants to make him the head of this revolution that he's planning because he sees him as cold and strong and so he's not emotional but in all actuality he is none of those things. He actually just holds himself aloof because of these deep secrets that he feels like he can't reveal. While Stavrogin is talking to Tikhon about these things he expresses this deep remorse and regret for what he has done and he starts talking about how he sees this girl's face everywhere every day he hallucinates and he feels like it is like a demon haunting him and his own evilness inside of him taunting him for doing this thing and for someone who apparently doesn't care and has no emotion has no moral compass has no conscience he wouldn't have any regret at all. And we see that in Piotr, Stepan's son, that he is ruthless and he is cold and he is almost inhuman in the way that he behaves at times. Like he does have rage and anger. He does have emotions, but he's so calculating and he does not care and shows absolutely no remorse for anything that he's done. So interestingly, when this confession is brought to Tikhon the monk, what he does is he compares Stavrogan with the church in Laodicea, which is in the book of Revelations. It's one of the letters written to one of the churches. And there's a message to this church saying that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you'd be one or the other, but since you're lukewarm, I vomit you out. And those are words spoken from Jesus to the church. And Tikhon is relating this to Stavrogan because he claims to be an atheist, but then at other moments he can't help this deep-seated belief from bubbling up out of him. And so he keeps waffling back and forth and he can't decide where to land and he doesn't know what he what he actually wants to do, what decision he wants to make. And Tikhon is saying, this is making you lukewarm. You could be cold like an atheist and God would rather you be that or wholeheartedly choose him, then be this weird in between. But because Stavrogan does have regret, Tikhon can see that it is not too late for Stavrogan to be redeemed. And Stavrogan says he's going to publish this confession and then maybe he will find redemption. Maybe this apparition of this girl, these hallucinations will stop because he will have somehow absolved his sin. And when I first read this, <laughs> Tikhon advises him not to do that. And I was just like, why? Why? He deserves to pay for like this gross thing that he did and for him to come forward and to be honest with it surely would cause some sort of, you know, repercussions and some sort of justice to be done. But Tikhon saw that this confession was pointless for several reasons. First of all, because justice would not happen. This was a poor tradesman's daughter whose own parents really didn't care about her that much. And now this family is gone. No one even knows who they were or where they are now. And it's been years and years since this has happened. And 
no one is is going to care about this at all. So Stavrogan would not be scorned and he would not be prosecuted. Instead, Tikhon could see that because in the eyes of people who were in charge at that time, that these poor class people had no value at all, he knew that what would happen instead is that Stavrogan would become a laughing stock, that people would wonder why he cared at all, why he was even upset about this at all, because it's not like this person actually mattered, and that was how society would feel about it. He could also see that Stavrogan's motivation for wanting to absolve his guilt through this confession was not because he wanted to give this public demonstration of humility and repentance, but because he wanted people to actually feel sorry for him. And he wanted this form of like self-immolation, this form of almost martyrdom. He wanted to make himself the victim, which is really disgusting when you think about it, because obviously we can see <laughs> that the victim was this little girl and not him. But that was his whole motivation and then actually coming forward with this confession. Instead of coming forward with this confession, Tikhon urges Stavrogan instead to join a monastery, even if he didn't decide to actually take the vows as a monk to live in a monastery quietly away from the world for a few years. And then he said that that would actually do much more wonders for your soul than confessions. You would actually then be being changed and actually be renewing your mind and not being stuck in this place and not being with all these worldly people who are not influencing you well and you wouldn't be all that you would actually change and actually find real repentance. Stavrogan feels that he doesn't deserve forgiveness, which he doesn't and honestly none of us do and I found myself like not really wanting him <laughs> to find forgiveness for such a heinous and a terrible act. But as a Christian, when I was reading this, I just realized that that is not my place as a human. Like, yes, there are consequences for things that are done that shouldn't be done. Yes, we do have a judicial system, but it is not my place as a human to determine for God who is actually capable of repentance and who should be forgiven and whose Christ's blood was shed for or whose wasn't. That is not my place at all, which is a good thing because I think that I would not <laughs> be just or fair and God is. So that's something that we can leave in his hands, which is encouraging to me. But Stavrogan says that Christ incidentally will not forgive. For it is said in the book, whoso shall offend one of these little ones, remember? According to the gospel, there is not and cannot be any greater crime. In this book, he pointed to the gospel. I have glad tidings for you about that. Tikhon spoke with tender failing. Christ too will forgive, if only you attain to forgiving yourself. Oh, no, no, do not believe that I have spoken of blasphemy. Even if you do not attain to reconciliation with yourself and forgiveness of yourself, even then he will forgive you for your intention and for your great suffering. For there are no words or thoughts in human language to express all the ways and reasons of the Lamb until his ways are openly revealed to us. Who can embrace him who is unembraceable? Who can grasp the whole of him who is infinite? So then because of Tikhon's urging for Stavrogan to not publish this confession, but instead to join a monastery, he says, you are in the grip of a desire for martyrdom and self-sacrifice. Conquer this desire as well. Set aside your pages and your intention, and then you will overcome everything. You will put to shame all your pride and your demon. You will win you will attain freedom. Tikhon's insistence is not only rooted in his desire to actually see Stavrogan saved, but also because he can see the alternative. He can see that Stavrogan is teetering on this brink and he's either going to fall towards Christ, fall towards repentance, or he's going to tip entirely the other way towards a path of even more self-destruction than what he has already done. We see this later in further deaths that are caused because of Stavrogan, at least three. <laughs> and then also 
his own. Which brings me back again to the comparison between Stepan and Stavrogan, because we see that they both claim to be atheists and that they both have these other things within themselves that kind of speak to the contrary, but their stories end so differently. We see that despite Stavrogan's seeming coldness, that he actually has deep feeling and regret. And we see that despite Stepan's emotional confusion, he actually ends in clarity. In the end, Stepan actually comes to faith and dies in peace. And he says, my immortality is necessary if only because God will not want to do an injustice and utterly extinguish the fire of the love for him once kindled in my heart. And what is more precious than love? Love is higher than being. Love is the crown of being. And is it possible for being not to bow before it? If I have come to love him and rejoice in my love, is it possible that he should extinguish both me and my joy and turn us to naught? If there is God, then I am immortal. There is my profession of faith. He goes on to say that this immortality of man and this deep-seated knowledge within yourself that God is necessary because he is the only being who can be loved eternally, he calls this the great thought and that it's something that resides within each man whether or not he is aware of it. And it takes Stepan his whole life to be aware of what he had kind of been grasping towards for quite some time. He recognizes within himself and within Pyodor, his son, within Stavrogan, he sees these seeds of these ideas that have been harmful and this clinging to these things that he's just so uncertain of and he sees that they are rising up and harming Russia in the form of, you know, some of these rebellions and some of the death and the tragedy that has occurred where he lives just in the short amount of time before his own death. And at the beginning of this book, it actually opens with a passage from Luke about the story of Jesus casting the legion of demons out of the demon possessed men and into the pigs, which then run off a cliff and kill themselves. And then the demon possessed man is now free and at peace and sits at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. And his conclusion is that as, as he is dying and as other people are suffering and dying, he sees them as being the pigs that are possessed by these demons and by them dying and going off the cliff now now Russia can be in her right mind and sit at the feet of Christ. We see a totally different ending for Nikolai Stavrogan as in the very end of the book he writes a letter to a woman and asks her to be with him as now he is just basically destroyed his life and just about everyone who had contact with him. And he writes her this, this letter that's a little bit lengthy and he seems to just keep going back and forth and back and forth and you see this confusion and tumult in his mind. And he says, I know I ought to kill myself, to sweep myself off the earth like a vile insect, but I'm afraid of suicide because I'm afraid of showing magnanimity. I know it will be one more deceit, the last deceit in an endless series of deceits. What's the use of deceiving oneself so as just to play at magnanimity? There can never be indignation or shame in me, and so no despair either. Upon receiving this letter, Stavrogan's mother and this woman rush to where he says that he's staying, and they found that he has hanged himself and killed himself. And so you are left with this question at the end of the book of, did he kill himself out of remorse and out of a way of saying, this is, this is it, I'm paying for my sins, this is my absolution? Or is it again this view of like, I'm the martyr, I'm the victim, look at what this drove me to? Is it the same thing that Tikhon warned against? Because he could see that if Stavrogan didn't publish his confession and didn't walk away like he wanted to, he would do other things to prevent having to publish this horrendous confession. And you see him putting off and putting off and saying he's going to publish this confession in other parts of the story. And instead what happens is he ends up ruining a woman who dies, his clandestine wife and her brother are both killed, not directly by him, but as a result of him. And then it ultimately ends in this tumultuous 
suicide and it leaves you to wonder like what what was truly going through his mind at that moment was it really regret was it being haunted by the imagery of what he had done over and over again or was this the last straw the thing that Tikon warned about would be this thing that would be worse than what he had begun with and so I still don't know where I fall on that <laughs> because it's it's an interesting conversation and I'm just I'm not sure exactly where where what I think and where I think he ended because I don't think the book is overly clear about that and I think that views are very skewed on that in general in terms of just being all over the place you know I've seen some people say well no this was because he actually had remorse and he couldn't live with this anymore and some people have said no this was you know what was being warned against that this was you know the thing you couldn't come back from the like the last thing and then there are some people who said well he felt like he'd done everything and he still didn't feel anything so this was his last attempt to actually like really feel something and so there are viewpoints that are all over the board and so if you've read this book I would love to hear your viewpoints and what you think that means for him because I do think it is something that is kind of open to interpretation. Well this has been a very lengthy video but as I told the people that I read this book with I felt like I could talk for like an entire hour just on that deleted chapter alone because there is so much wealth of information in there I feel like you really don't understand Stavrogan and his motivations without that chapter so I'm really thankful that the version that I have does have that in there because some versions do not have the censored chapter in there and I think it's a very important one and one that also kind of tackles and grapples through the idea of repentance, of absolution for sin, of regret, of remorse, of all these different things that I think are very meaningful for Christians and people of faith and I found it to be incredibly thought-provoking and I'm really really glad not just that I read the book as a whole but I'm also really glad that I read that chapter because uh, it's one that I have brought up multiple times to my husband. We have had many many discussions about this book despite the fact that he has not read it but it was just very interesting to have conversations and it's been a book that I haven't been able to get out of my mind. So thank you for those of you who might have actually made it all the way through this incredibly kind of rambly lengthy videos about my thoughts on this book. If you've read it as well I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video please hit like and also subscribe so you can continue to see more bookish content from me and I will see you again next time.